Those who do not understand near-death experiences reject the reality. They claim that they're little more than fantasy. So, when trying to understand near-death experiences, where does one seek answers? Do you look to faith, or do you look to science? Well, do you blindly take a leap of faith, or do you turn to atheism? The belief that there was nothing, and then nothing happened to nothing, and then nothing suddenly exploded, for no reason whatsoever, creating everything. And then, a bunch of everything rearranged itself into self-replicating particles, which turned into dinosaurs. <laughs> it was funny, when I was doing that, I saw it on Facebook about an hour later. Someone goes, was that Mark Anthony? At, you know, <laughs> it was actually Universal Studios, but at any rate. Um, nothing that happens is by chance. Synchronicity. This is a complex chain of events, of intertwining events, influenced by the flow of energy which connects and binds everything in existence. And not just the fact that you had a near-death experience. Our very existence is the greatest synchronistic anomaly of all. Does that sound far-fetched? The primordial explosion, known as the Big Bang, is a or was a collision of equal parts of matter and antimatter, which should have uh, uh, resulted in a total void in its aftermath. Now, everyone who's familiar with science fiction knows about matter and antimatter. It fuels the Starship Enterprise. It's used in Star Wars. But it's a real thing. And uh, we know from, from atoms, you have a proton, which is positive, and an electron, which is negative. And it, the collision of matter and antimatter is the most efficient explosion known to science. So when the Big Bang occurred, nothing should have been left over to create galaxies, planets, and life forms. And this is not science fiction. In fact, Christian Smora, the head researcher at CERN, which is the European nuclear research facility, uh, last year issued a report. He said, all of our observations find a complete symmetry between matter and antimatter, which is why the universe should not actually exist. And here's what's even more interesting, is when physicists come out and say, it appears forces beyond our understanding are not only at work, but have a direct involvement in our daily lives and existence. The problem, though, with closed-minded people is that their mouths are always open. <laughs> right, how many of you have had to put up with that with your NDE? Show of hands, right? All right, is that it? One person? Seriously, come on. we got a whole bunch of NDEers. Right, raise your damn hands. Come on. <laughs> All right, so a lot of people have negated, negated things that they do not understand. And the late, great Wayne Dyer said, the highest form of ignorance is when you reject something you don't know anything about. And last year when I was lecturing at Edgar Cayce um, uh, Center in Virginia Beach, I met his daughter Serena and Sajay. They're carrying on his legacy, and it was a real privilege to get to meet them. Now, let's look at the flip side of the coin, where we are under attack as those who have had near-death experiences, materialism. And the reductive materialists say the only thing that can be proven to exist is matter. Everything is a mix of matter and energy operating according to the laws of physics. Reality is what is observable, objective, and reproducible. The supernatural does not exist. Neither do spirits, the afterlife, near-death experiences, or God. The four main weapons in the NDE arsenal are expectancy, birth memories, altered brain gases, toxic and metabolic substances. So, let's take each one of these Scud missiles at a time. Being a lawyer, I love destroying arguments of the opposition. Expectancy. What expectancy says? 
The skeptics say that a near-death experience is constructed from personal and cultural expectations and experiences, and it's a protection against your fear of death. In other words, you create a fanciful place that you go to because really there's nothing beyond this existence. However, why do NDEers report experiences that conflict with their religious beliefs and their personal explanations of death? Why do people with no knowledge of near-death experiences report the same type of encounters and experiences as people familiar with NDEs? And why do young children with little or no religious indoctrination, much less expectancy of an afterlife, why do they report the same things as people who have near-death experiences and adults? So there goes the expectancy argument. Birth memories. Yeah. Okay, so traveling through a dark tunnel into a new realm towards a bright white light is remembering how, when you're born except for the fact that newborns lack the visual acuity, mental alertness, and cortical capacity to register memories of the birth experience. So that one gets shot down pretty quick. Okay, here's a good one. Altered brain gases. Now, the NDE is caused by anoxia, an oxygen-starved brain, or hypoxia, low levels of oxygen in the brain. Well, NDEs may occur without anoxia or hypoxia as in non-life-threatening illnesses and near accidents. Anoxia and hypoxia often produces frightening and disturbing hallucinations, which is a stark contrast to the euphoria in most near-death experiences. And then, of course, studies have shown that NDEers who have the same oxygen levels as those with, with um, in other words, the amount of oxygen in your brain has no impact whatsoever on your NDE. So you can have a brain chock full of oxygen or an oxygen-starved brain, and the example is the same. That's actually the best argument they come up with, but it doesn't, it doesn't work. Then, of course, toxic or metabolic hallucinations. So what they're saying is that the NDE is caused by drugs or hallucinations caused by foreign substances, except for the fact that drugs are not a factor in an NDE, and they're experienced by people not under the influence of drugs or alcohol, and by people with no metabolic or organic brain malfunction. So there goes the four arguments in the materialist reductionist arsenal. Dr. John Hagen, editor of the Missouri Medicine Medical Journal and NDE researcher, has said, we can now bring patients back from death who have traveled further on the path than at any other time in history. Their recollections often refute a physician's scientific explanation of how an oxygen-starved brain can produce such vivid and often corroborated veridical recollections. And veridical perception NDEs is the cornerstone to their validity. And we're seeing them in several instances. Uh, for example, um, there was a woman in Japan, and she died. She went into the light and encountered her sister. And she said to her parents when she was revived at the hospital, but this cannot be because my sister's alive. And her parents said, actually, she was killed in a car accident yesterday. She did not know that. An elderly woman who was blind since birth saw instruments, techniques, and what the, the surgeons and the uh, hospital, the operating room personnel were wearing, and she described uh, things in, in exact visual detail. Now, one of the criticisms is that when you're dying, that you're just drawing upon stored memories. But if this woman were blind since birth, and that information was never in her brain, how is it that when she's dying, is she suddenly having these experiences? Then a dying girl left her body, went to another room, and saw her older sister saying, Kathy, please don't die, please don't die. These are just a few of the thousands upon thousands of veridical accounts of what happens to somebody when their consciousness separates 
from their brain. So, a near-death experience is a life-changing event, and the ears lose their fear of death. They emerge calmer, less judgmental, less materialistic. They become more spiritual, compassionate, loving, enhanced psychic ability, sense of timelessness. They feel interconnected, which means strong with the force near-death experiencers are. Oh, come on, you've all seen Star Wars, right? George Lucas, at age 16, had a near-death experience. He died in a car accident. He flatlined for over 20 minutes. And by the time he was 22 years old, he had a draft of Star Wars. Tell me there isn't a connection there. Now, why am I talking so much about George Lucas and the Force? Well, the Force in George Lucas's Star Wars world is what gives a Jedi Knight his power. It is an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. We know from particle physics that everything on a subatomic level, that molecules are made of atoms. Atoms are composed of electrons, protons, and neutrons. And they are composed of a smaller unit, quanta, which is electromagnetic energy. Everything is composed on its most basic level of electromagnetic energy. You, me, the floor, the light that's shining upon me, the air that we're breathing, the space between the earth and the sun, the nuclear reactions within the sun, everything is energy. Everything is the force. And the interesting thing is when you look at how George Lucas describes this, here we see positive and negative energy um, conflicting. Darth Vader represents materialism, self-centeredness, the desire for power, greed, anger, aggression. These are all the creatures created by our human ego, our base level desires. Obi-Wan Kenobi, the Jedi Knights, compassion, selflessness, intense generosity, a desire for peace. You think all of this was just a fluke that George Lucas created? Absolutely not. This shows an after effect of NDE is how one of the most fascinating pop culture phenomenons is the direct result of a near-death experience that George Lucas had, and something which pretty much affects us all. Albert Einstein said, there is no matter, there is just energy which vibrates at different frequencies. Astronaut Edgar Mitchell said that when subatomic matter is in a process together, Subsequently, the subatomic particles go apart from each other. They go apart from the universe. And when they do this, they will remain entangled. This means if you do something to one, the other responds immediately, instantaneously. In other words, the force. Everything is energetically interconnected. Now, with NDEs and after-death communication, there's two things I'd like to talk about. First off, the interconnectedness. Now, people ask me about this quite a bit, and this is one of the topics I explain in my book, Evidence of Eternity. Think of everyone that you know being connected by a vast three-dimensional spider web. We're all interconnected energetically. Think of when you die that your soul is a drop of water. Your consciousness leaves this, ma this uh, material world container and plunges into this vast eternal ocean and is now interconnected with everything everywhere. That's what happens when you have an NDE and we go from a finite state of perception, which is how we're seeing things now because our brain is constructed to perceive things in a finite limited matter. Everything that we know has a beginning, a middle, and an end and boundaries. That's why people think that you're born, you grow old, and you die, and everything happens in a linear perspective. But we know from the near-death experience, this is not the case. And so that is how we're all energetically interconnected because we're going from our finite state, a lower vibration, to the higher vibration where we become one with the force, the electromagnetic energy that binds and connects everything. After death communication, the collective consciousness and frequency beacons. The collective consciousness is the other side. How many people 
here, that when you've had your NDE, encountered just one person and felt solitary and alone on the other side. I doubt anybody did. You all of a sudden you feel this intense sense of love. You feel this intense energy that's binding and connecting you. That is what is meant by interconnectedness. Now, frequency beacons, that three-dimensional spider web. Let's take the spider out of it. Okay. How does the spider know something's in the web, though? Something like, say, a fly hits the web and a vibration moves along the web. What spirits will do is they can direct our attention to something. For example, let's say you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you feel that you need to turn on the radio and there's that song that makes you think of that person that you love who died. Or, gee, every time I look at a, at a, a penny, um, I find pennies all the time. I think of my Uncle Dave who passed. Or I smell this, this perfume. My mother always wore Chanel Number no. 5, yet there was no bottle of Chanel Number no. 5 around. Do you think this is just a fluke? These are frequency beacons that spirits are transmitting to us that will draw our attention to a particular thing. I get people all the time, oh, I, oh every time I see a, a cardinal or I see a dragonfly or I see a, uh, the other day I got owls. That was a new one. <laughs> this lady says she always sees owls and the first thing she thinks of is her father. And I was doing a reading at a gallery event and I said, so what's with the owls? And she goes, oh my God. Every time I see owls, I think of my dad. Well, he was letting her know, he was giving her the validation through me that this is a frequency beacon. And guess what? They're, it's a two-way street. You ever been really thinking about someone on the other side real heavily and then you feel that they're around you? Because we are emitting a vibration along that energetic tether. So this is all about energy vibration and how spirits communicate with us. These are also the building blocks to our understanding of what a near-death experience and after-death communication is. Near-death experiences are very near and dear to my heart. One of the happiest days of my life was the day that I graduated law school. And perhaps it was also one of the most unhappy days of my life. I haven't figured that out. Any lawyers in the audience will know what I'm talking about. <laughs> my father was a Navy SEAL and a NASA engineer. My mother was a fashion designer, a model, and a commercial illustrator. All three of us throughout our lives had near-death experiences, and all three of us were born psychic medium. My mother, Jeannie, um, her near-death experience happened just a little bit before this period of time in my life. She was on an operating table. She had um, horrible Crohn's disease, and her intestines burst, and the peritonitis spread, spread through her body, and she died on the table. And she was gone for about 20 minutes, but they kept working on her, working on her, and she said she went into the light, and there were several people there. She was particularly close to her father. And she said, I saw my father, and I just wanted to go with him. But he said to her, Jeannie, it's not your time. And she said, the voice that I heard was not the voice that I hear in my head. My dad had two NDEs. When he was 16 years old, he was in a terrible car accident. He said that he felt like he was floating above the wreck, and he looked down, and he said it was about 30, 40 feet above, and all these people were running to the car wreck. And he saw this incredible white light. He goes, ah, oh, I feel great. Okay, I'm dead. He said it was the most amazing feeling. And the next thing he knows, I'm back in my body. And he goes, and it hurt like hell. He said there he was, and people were pounding on him. And he was like, oh, my gosh. Then about 10 years later, my dad was a U.S. diver. And during uh, the war, he had been one of the original Navy frogmen. His unit evolved into the Navy SEALs. And... He actually, after the war, dove with Jacques Cousteau, and he was off the coast of New Jersey. I was so fortunate to find this picture of him. He told me he was at 150 feet deep, and his regulator jammed. He said he started sucking water, and he goes, I went into to seizures. He goes, I was drowning. And the voice returned, and he said, the voice said to him, Earl, it's not your time. And my dad said, I have no idea what happened, but my regulator started working. I started sucking oxygen, and I came back. And I remember when I wanted to go for scuba lessons, he said, like hell you are. <laughs> <laughs> About 15 years after that, 
I came along, and my dad, um, working for NASA, he had to be away. Actually, he was working for Mar Martin Marietta, which is now Lockheed Martin, and we were living in Orlando, and I was very, very sick. And I, I was running a, a 104 fever, and I went into convulsions, and I stopped breathing. And my mother was horrified, and she scooped me up, and she ran out in front of the house and started screaming, help me, my baby is dying. And my, my sister was on the phone calling zero, because back then they didn't have 911, and she's calling for an ambulance. And my brother ran across the street, because he knew that a cop lived there, and the guy just happened to be off work that day, and he had his patrol car out front. So he zooms over, they put me in the patrol car, and they take off. And he's, he's, he's radioing, he's going, okay, okay, and he actually intercepted the ambulance. And they took me into the ambulance, my mom uh, jumped in, they put a ventilator on me, and I started coming back for a bit, but they, when the ambulance was speeding the hospital, the door slammed on the ventilator's hose. And all of a sudden, I stopped breathing, and I remember the last thing I hear is, he's dying, and this flash of white light happened, and then all of a sudden, and I, I, when I found this picture, I, I was really kind of shook me, because I've always described that I went through this bright light, and then there was these beings there, and the only way I could ever describe them is they kind of looked like Academy Awards, except they were translucent, and I saw this picture, and, and it was called light beings, and apparently a lot of people see light beings. What's really fascinating is in my work as a medium, when I encounter, and we all know, or maybe we all know, that on the other side there's more than just human spirits. There's also non-human spiritual intelligence. And when I encounter a being that you might call an angel, they kind of look like that. So there's all these liquid light beings, and they're real sweet and real nice, and they said, Mark, you're okay and you're going to come back. Meanwhile, in the ambulance, the, 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 uh, the paramedic says, we've got to get this door open, and my mom goes, I'll do it. And so they're going 90 miles an hour. The paramedic grabs on. She's wearing this, you know, like Lucille Ball type of skirt thing. He grabbed onto her waist. She pried the door open. They pulled it on. Also, like, <laughs> it came back. They go, we got him, you know, <laughs> like that. And so I remember coming back, and I haven't, well, I've seen the light beings in, in, in mediumistic contact, but I was back. And it was cool having parents that were mediums because when I was talking about them, mom's like, oh, they're just angels. You know, so, you know, yeah, I mean, seeing spirits was not a big deal in my household. We were kind of like the Adams family, but, you know, more on the white light side, unless you talk to the religious fanatics down the street. All right, so my dad, this is tough. This is the first time I've talked about this to a large group. Um, this picture was taken two years ago. I was honored and privilege to accompany him on the honor flight. And if any of you ever get the chance to do that, if, if, if you are a veteran or to be a guardian for a veteran, and the honor flight is an organization and they fly veterans free of charge to Washington, D.C., and they're assigned a guardian, and I, I volunteered to be his guardian, and so that they can visit all the monuments that are erected to them. And you know, this is my dad's last great adventure because he was dying of cancer at this point. And he degenerated steadily after this. Uh, this was in September of 2016. And then in early October 2017, I crawled into bed with him to take a selfie. And he was gone about 10 days later. And it was really intense. And, and my siblings and I, we took care of him. We, we didn't put him in a facility. We made the decision. We're going to be there with him every step of the way. And um, in, in the final hours, I started seeing things. And family members started keeping track. I, we counted 26 spirits. We've been able to identify 21 of them so far. And, and what is interesting is that a lot of these people I don't know because they died before I was born. And then I started... It was, it was a beautiful Saturday morning, and he was laying in bed, and we knew the end was coming. Hospice said he was act actively dying, and I started seeing a light forming above his head, and it felt like this vortex was opening. And then 15 minutes later, he breathed his last. But there were several people there. There was about there were seven people there, and, and two dogs, two little uh, King Charles dogs, one that just loved my dad. and. 
there was a shared death experience. Now, it's one thing for me to see spirits, but it's another for people who aren't mediums. And shared death experience, at the time of a person's death, bystanders or onlookers observe phenomena associated with the energy of a spirit leaving a body, not just relatives and close friends, but nurses, doctors, and other medical personnel. Well, we pretty much had all of that going on there. And the characteristics of an SDE, a shared death experience, a transparent repl replica of a dying person leaves the body. And when my dad died, I saw this surge go right through the ceiling. And I remember going, oh my God. And then there's a feeling of people, they, they kind of feel dizzy, like they're leaving their own bodies. Indescribably beautiful music. Apparitions of the dead person's deceased loved ones. I was definitely getting that. And then suddenly, the light filling the room. And when Dad stopped breathing, it, the, the room got brighter. And it was like, you know when a car drives up in your driveway and the sun hits the uh, windshield? and it, Well, there was no car in the driveway, but for, for a few seconds, the room got brighter. Because I remember hearing... Um, my friend Nancy and my friend Jiggle, what was that? He goes, what was that? And then I saw the surge as dad left his body. And this is one of the, uh, the aspects of shared death experiences that Dr. Raymond Moody um, has talked about in the science of near-death experiences. And this is also, as many of you probably know, a new field in near-death experience research is a shared death experience. Now, why? Why do non-mediums, why do people experience a shared death experience? Remember when I was talking about the force, the quanta, the electromagnetic energy that binds all of us? Well, as a person is getting ready to leave his or her body, there's a frequency shift. And people who may not necessarily be mediums or people who not necessarily know anything about NDEs, it starts affecting their electromagnetic fields, which is why they begin to experience these phenomena. Well, no matter how much we know or think we know about the afterlife, it still hurts when somebody you love dies. And I'd be lying if I didn't say it really hurt bad. And I had to get away from everybody. They were all crying and, and, and weeping, and I was too. And I went to a room. We were in my dad's house. I went to this room, and I closed the door, and I sat down. And all of a sudden... In the midst of my tears, I started getting cold chills and tingles. And it's like, that's the sensation I get when I open up to frequency and spirits start coming in. And I looked up, and there's my parents, my mom and my dad. However, this is what I think of when I think of my parents. This photo was taken at my mom's birthday party not long before she passed. So I think of them as elderly people, okay? And, and you saw the pictures of my dad uh, right before he passed. When I think of dad, that's how I think of him. But that's not who showed up. That's who showed up. My dad was 21. My mom was 19. They had me 15 years after this. I never saw them look like that. And I'm standing there, and I see dad, except he was wearing his Navy uniform, and he had that V-shape, and he's giving me that, you know, go do some sit-ups look. And, and mom looked like a knockout. You know, mom, you know, she, she was glamorous, okay? And, and that's who showed up. Now, if this is the information in a dying brain or a grief-induced hallucination, why wouldn't they show up looking to me in the most familiar way. And how many times in near-death experiences do we hear about people who go into the light and you see your loved ones, not as they looked when they're dying of cancer or elderly or, or really sick, but looking their best when they're young and beautiful. Why is that? I believe that, young, that, that loved ones appear young and healthy because consciousness who and what we really are, the electromagnetic quantum field in our brain, our soul, our spirit, whatever you want to call the energy that makes us who we are, is pure energy. Energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. That's one of the laws of thermodynamics. That's physics. That is not philosophy. Energy 
does not get old. It doesn't get sick. It doesn't get tired. It doesn't die. So why are they doing this? They're doing this because energy is eternal. And that's part of the message that we're getting. So in spirit communication, a lot of times... When they come through, you know, it'd be very nice if it was texting or instant messaging where they'd hold up a sign, but it's not always like that. They're giving us images, sensations, feelings, so that we can then understand what they're doing. And I'll never forget the first time, or one of the first times I saw my mom after she died, um, I encountered her, and initially she looked elderly, and then she morphed into this um, beautiful version of herself. And I go, Mom, why do you do that? And she said, because I can. <laughs> <laughs> interdimensional communication that's what i refer to when i, I talk about after-death communication and mediumship near-death experiences shared death experiences and after-death communication is an alignment of frequency between the material world dimension that's where we live and the other side and since the beginning of recorded history, there have been accounts of people who have been able to communicate with the other side, accounts of after-death communication. Think about the visible spectrum, okay? I, I love it when the materialists say, well, only what is observable it, it, we, can, we can prove. Well, think of a yardstick, okay? And one line on the yardstick is the visible light spectrum, and that's what we can perceive. But within the electromagnetic spectrum, we have cosmic rays, gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet, infrared, microwaves, radar, radio, broadcast band. So what we can see is a minute fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum. Then, NASA put out a report in 2015 about dark matter. Dark matter neither emits nor scatters light and cannot be detected by our technology. Its existence is inferred from gravitational effects on visible matter. As much as 90% of the universe is dark matter. M more is unknown than known. Dark matter exists. It's a complete mystery, but an important one. And so NASA is saying that over 90% of what exists is beyond not just our five physical senses of sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell, but our technology. So over 90% of what exists is beyond our current ability to perceive it. And uh, since that report, Albert Einstein theorized about gravitational waves, that two black holes, which are related to dark matter, collide, and they send these waves of gravity, okay, moving at the speed of light. Well, guess what? In 2016, LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Observatory, detected gravitational waves, thus proving Einstein's theory in 1916. So now we know that not only does dark matter exist, but it can influence us even though those black holes are thousands of light years from Earth. ESP, that's kind of a... We don't really hear that term used so much anymore, but extrasensory perception is the acquisition of information that could not have been received by normal sensory means. The sixth sense. And people always ask me, you know, is what you do like that movie, The Sixth Sense? Yeah, except they don't walk around with machetes sticking out of their head, you know? If you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, the sixth sense enables us to perceive what the physical senses cannot, and it is also the mechanism for communication with discarnate intelligence, in other words, spirits. Is there a physiological basis to spirit communication? 5,000 years ago in India, the Hindus developed what's known as the chakras, and they're all aligned with different colors. Uh, it's red, orange, yellow, uh, a green, um, yeah, green, a blue, indigo, and a white, violet light. And um, as a former prosecutor and criminal defense attorney, I can say that too many of my clients spend way too much focus on the red chakra, which is why they end up in court and in jail. But um, focusing on the spiritual chakras now, let's move over to the solar plexus and the pineal gland, okay? Pineal gland being in your brain, the solar plexus being right here at the base of your sternum. 
The solar plexus, it is, was named because it appears like the rays of the sun emanating from this bundle of nerves at the bottom of your sternum. And it is the largest and most complex nerve center outside of the cerebral cortex in your body. Show of hands, everyone, all the ladies here who have women's intuition. Come on, show of hands. All right, ladies, just all raise your hand. All right, <laughs> all right, guys, how many of you have gut instinct? All right, yeah, okay. When people feel it in their gut, that's because vibrationally, this is where you're getting it. And this chakra, this energy center, controls emotional vibrations. And so those old sayings about, you know, I have a gut feeling, or I feel it in my stomach, you know, men like to call it gut instinct, women call it intuition. We're talking about the same um, ability. Why? Because your nervous system functions on electricity, and you're picking up on the electromagnetic impulses that hit the, the solar plexus. Now, the pineal gland, this is a fascinating little lima bean-sized gland about four, eh, four and a half inches or so behind the center of your forehead. Recent studies in Great Britain found that it contains calcite and magnetite crystals, and this was verified by a French, Israeli, and a German study. So calcite and magnetite both have electromagnetic properties. It also is believed to regulate um, it secretes the hormones that affect your reticular activating system, which regulates your brain wave patterns. It controls your circadian rhythms. All right, when you get jet lag, it's because your pineal gland hasn't been able to adapt to the time zone you're in yet. So when you get jet lag, it's a real thing. Blame the pineal gland. And it also controls your perception of light. Interesting. Does it just control your perception of physical light, or does it control your perception of spiritual light? Brainwave frequencies. In recent decades, um, we've discovered brainwaves uh, come from the electrical activity in the brain, and they change depending on what you're doing. So, for instance, the brainwaves of somebody sleeping are much different than someone who's awake. And over the years, more sensitive equipment has brought us closer to figuring out what brainwaves represent and what they mean about a person's health and state of mind. There's four main brain, brain waves, beta, alpha, theta, and delta. Beta is the state we're in when we're alert, awake, helps you tie your shoes, write your checkbooks, hopefully, you know, drive to work. That's when you're awake. Then, when you start to relax and you drift into alpha, I call that the groovy baby state. You know, it's like, hey, baby, I got alpha. You got medical marijuana and legal marijuana here in Washington, right? There's a lot of alpha waves going on in this state. <laughs> Theta is when you go even deeper, okay? And this is, you know, people who meditate. And then Delta, um, that's real deep sleep or, you know, really bad. But what we are seeing is when measuring and quantifying psychic activity, that it's between the alpha and the theta border, that your brain waves get to a point, spirits are able to bring their frequency down, you get a frequency match, voila, spirit communication. That's why people who are not mediums are capable of a mediumistic experience. That's why people who have a shared death experience are experiencing that because all of a sudden your brainwave is aligning to this frequency from the other side. So everyone is capable of experiencing interdimensional communication whether or not you're a medium. And I think that's a good thing because a lot of people are telling me, well, how do I develop this? I've actually had people say, if I have a near-death experience, Will that help me become a medium? Do not test that theory. <laughs> All right? Because it may not be a near death experience. It may be a death experience. Okay? You know, NDEs is kind of like a rubber band. You know, we're on the material. Oh, well, hi, God. Well, this is bam, you're back. All right? But, you know, a lot of people are kind of nuts and they're like, well, I want to enhance my psychic ability. Meditate. Okay? And what you have to realize is not everybody's a medium. Okay? Um, like, look, I can swim. I will never be Michael Phelps. I can play guitar. I'll never be Jimmy Page or Axl Rose or any of those people, all right? But the thing is, we're all good at doing different things. And mediums are like telephones through which communication takes place. 
Interdimensional communication appears to be a form of telepathy. In other words, when a, group, a spirit or a group of spirits come in, they begin to emit waves of frequency. And that vibrational frequency then enters the medium's brain and gets converted into recognizable concepts based on my memories, feelings, and cultural associations. Legitimate mediums do not need a Ouija board. Okay, I get invited to a lot of paranormal conferences and the boogie-woogie people are there with their black mirrors and Ouija boards. Those are assistive devices and crutches, okay, and actually a bunch of garbage. Um, scary cells. I mean, look at the horror movie industry, all right? Scary cells. And the truth is that interdimensional communication is not frightening and the medium is not possessed in any way. Interdimensional communication. How does it help those who are living in the material world? Well, it presents evidence of the afterlife, and it's up to the jury to decide. Faith is a personal decision. So as an evidential medium and as near-death experiencers. So there's some people who are never going to believe you. You present the evidence, let them decide what to do with it. Messages of love, healing, and resolution. These are the positive benefits of after-death communication, interdimensional communication. But why? Why do spirits want to communicate? After all, when's the last time you saw a U-Haul behind a hearse? Well, for starters, spirits are concerned about us. People say, do they miss me? Well, no. Well, what is that supposed to mean? That's insulting. Well, they don't miss you because they can be with you any time that they want. We miss them because it's a matter of our ability to perceive their presence. So they want to let you know, I love you, I exist, I'm fine. Then, there's also spirit intervention, which is designed to warn of a dangerous person, behavior, or medical condition. As a medium, I get a lot of this. Um... And whether or not people listen is up to them. I was doing a reading for this lady um, over the telephone, and her mother's spirit came through. And I kept hearing, Janet, Janet. I go, I'm hearing the name Janet. She goes, that's not my mother, but that's her best friend who's alive. I go, well, she's, I'm getting this thing about my eyes. There's something about Janet's eyes. She needs to get them checked. There's a problem. And she says, well, I haven't talked to Janet in a couple years. She'll probably think this is weird. I go, well, I'm delivering the message. So she calls Janet. I get an email two weeks later, and she said that, I told Janet this, totally freaked her out, and she says, you know, something's been going on with my eyes. So she made an appointment with an eye doctor who said, thank God you came in, because you're in the beginning phases of macular degeneration, and if you'd waited six months, we would not be able to reverse it. That's spirit intervention. Unfortunately, people don't always listen. I was in Houston doing a public event to a group about this size. And there was a younger couple in their late 20s. They stood up, and the spirits were really targeting the husband's GI tract and colon. I said, something is going on. And he's rolling his eyes, and the wife's, no, 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 he's fine. And they're giving me all kinds of attitude, and they were arguing with me. And I said, you know, you need to go for a blood test because I'm, I'm picking up. They're telling me that you have an elevated white blood cell count. No, we're fine. And they're like, you know, they, I remember the husband going like that. And I said, okay, that's fine. There's a lot of times I really wish I was wrong. And, and uh, that's one of them because two months later, I received an email from the wife. And she said, we really wish that we'd listen to you because... About a week after you did that reading, my husband's appendix burst, and it was so bad, they had to remove his colon. And he's on a colostomy now for the rest of his life. And the surgeon said, wow, if we would have had a blood test and seen the elevated white blood cell count, it would have alerted us to something. And I, I take no joy in that story whatsoever. But spirits are able to scan your electromagnetic field in your body, and they pick up on disruptions and then they'll transmit that information. That's one of the benefits of spirit communication is spirit intervention, where they will come through and warn you of a dangerous person, place, or thing. Spirits are not here to harm us or frighten us. Interdimensional communication proves the energy of consciousness is eternal. In fact, Thomas Edison, 
one of the great geniuses of all time, I think, he believed that interdimensional communication with spirits was possible technologically. And in uh, the 1921 Scientific American, he was interviewed, and he said, I do hope myself that personality survives and that we persist. If we do persist upon the other side of this grave, then my apparatus, with its extraordinary delicacy, should one day give us proof of that persistence and so of our eternal life. So he was working on what has been called the spirit phone. Unfortunately, he died. However, there is hope. Our friend and colleague, Dr. Gary Schwartz, is working on the Soul Phone Project. I'm honored to be on the board of directors of the Soul Phone Project. And from what I just heard from Dr. Schwartz, a major announcement will be made within the next year. Woohoo! But then that could put me out of business, you know. <laughs> or it will be live from the other side, you know. I, I, you know but uh, he's very, very excited. But does this sound like science fiction? Does it? Think about, think about what happens when you make a cell phone call. All of a sudden, an electrical impulse from your brain hits your lungs. So the electricity in your brain then transfers to muscular energy, compressing your lungs, and the air comes out of your lungs, and the vibration of your vocal cords then turns the muscular energy into sound wave energy, which then hits the plate in your cell phone, turning the sound wave energy, converting it into um, mechanical energy, which begins to vibrate, turning the mechanical energy into electrical energy, which then hits the antenna in your cell phone, turning the electrical energy into radio wave energy, which then goes through the atmosphere, then hits a tower, taking the radio wave energy, converting it to electrical energy, going through miles and miles of wires to a huge antenna, converting electrical energy into radio wave energy, which then gets shot up to a whole system of satellites. Then the radio wave energy is converted to microwave energy as it bounces off a series of satellites, finding the correct satellite to beam it down to a collection point in England, thus turning the microwave energy into radio wave energy, radio wave energy being converted into electrical energy, goes through miles of wires to a tower, turning the electrical energy into radio wave energy, which then hits the cell phone of Aunt Martha and becomes electrical energy, then becoming mechanical energy as the plate in her speaker begins to vibrate, turning the electrical energy into mechanical energy, and sound wave energy, which hits her eardrum vibrating, taking the mechanical energy, then the staples bones in her middle ear hit her eighth cranial nerve, taking that into electrical energy, which goes into her brain and becomes, hi, Aunt Martha. <laughs> and all of that happens at 186,282 miles per second. And you get annoyed when the cell phone call drops out. Oh, my God, I can't believe this. <laughs> so, <laughs> Nikola Tesla in 1926 said, when wireless is perfectly applied, the whole earth will be converted into a huge brain. We shall be able to communicate with one another instantly, irrespective of distance. Not only this, but through television and telephony, we shall see and hear one another as perfectly as though we were face to face despite intervening distances of thousands of miles, and the instruments through which we shall be able to do this will be amazingly simple compared with our present telephone, and a man will be able to carry one in his breast pocket. 1926, Tesla envisioned cell phones. So, the next time someone doubts your NDE, Remember, the force is with you. <laughs> I'll tell you what he did. <laughs> he sold Star Wars to Disney for $4 billion. So do not tell me that a near-death experience is not a life-enriching experience. <laughs> Except he donated almost all of it to charity. That is what a Jedi Knight does. That is compassion. That is generosity. That is being spiritual. That is charity. That is the after effect of a near-death experience. Thank you.